Man's savagery is often matched by his ingenuity. The unusual weapons that originated in the Far East reveal a human capacity for violence that first took root among ancient warriors. How did the ancient Chinese repel an enemy's arrows using armor made of paper? Did an ancient commander create the world's first unmanned weapon system that charged into battle nearly 2,000 years ago? And what was the most extreme, most violent and terrifying weapon the ancient world had ever seen? The twisted weapons of the East are our ancient discovery. Engineers at the forefront of 21st century military technology are constantly developing new ways to attack the enemy while minimizing the risk to their own troops. Unmanned ground vehicles are the latest addition to the arsenal of modern armies. But amazingly, this seemingly modern concept was first introduced onto the battlefield almost 2,000 years ago. In 180 AD, there was a major revolt in the district of Lingling in southeastern China. In those days, the Han Empire was still expanding into that area, and the local tribal peoples were being either absorbed into the Chinese Empire or pushed into the inhospitable mountains. Not surprisingly, they resented this and often fought back. A vast rebel horde of thousands rose up, and Ling Ling District needed help. The grand administrator of the local commandery was a man called Yang Xuan, who was called in when the situation spiraled out of the control of the local forces. Yang Xuan was met by a potentially disastrous situation. He had a woefully inadequate number of men to confront the rebel force. He was outnumbered by the rebels, so he's said to have resorted to an ingenious stratagem to break up their army. Yang Xuan designed an unmanned chariot armed with crossbows. The Han commander deployed chariots which were pulled by horses with burning rags attached to their tails and equipped with automatic crossbows which are said to have fired by some sort of gearing arrangement attached to the wheels. So he could send them forward without any soldiers manning them. And the crossbow chariots charged in, firing crossbows at random and causing panic in the rebel ranks. The hand forces then followed up and destroyed them. Ancient Chinese commanders had no qualms about sacrificing animals to achieve their military objectives. The horses pulling the chariots into battle would have stood no chance. They would certainly have died, either from fire spreading to their bodies from their tails or from enemy attack. Ancient model maker Richard Windley is investigating how this twisted weapon might have worked. To understand this complicated device, its component parts must be broken down. First, the crossbows. Yang would have chosen the weapon that gave him maximum firepower. And in second century China, this was the Lian Nu crossbow. The Lian Nu crossbow was a multiple bolt firing weapon, which is said to have been able to fire four or five bolts at the same time. But would it have been effective when used on the crossbow cart? To find out, Richard has built one. This is my reconstruction of the Lian Nu Chinese crossbow. We're not aware of anyone having built and tested one of these in recent times, so we're not really quite sure what it's going to do. So we've got the um, finished crossbow now uh, installed on a simple stand, and what we want to do is to load it and actually fire it at a fairly close target, just to see what happens with this spread of arrows, because really with the Lian Nu, this is a question that has not really been answered, is how these arrows actually fly. Three, two, one. Well, that's really, really interesting because this is the first time we've actually fired this crossbow in anger. And we can see from this that this is actually grouping fairly closely. So this is going to be a bit like a shotgun. We're getting concentrated firepower in a relatively small area. 
I think as far as the crossbow cart's concerned, this concentration of firepower in a limited area would have taken out a number of enemy soldiers, and that amount of energy striking a formation soldiers would probably cause a collapse in the formation, and that's probably what they were looking for. They were looking to break into the ranks of the enemy. The Leon Nu crossbow would have been an ideal weapon for Schwann's purposes. But before we can mount it on the cart, we must solve the mystery of how it could be triggered by the wheels. The early Chinese military manual shows all kinds of different triggering mechanisms for these crossbows. An illustration from an ancient Chinese text shows a battery of four Lian Nu, which appear to be triggered with a single string. Richard is at the Ancient Discoveries Testing Center to find out whether this ancient illustration can help him in his research into the crossbow cart. It struck me that this may well be the basis of the staggered firing system for a potential crossbow cart. First, we must establish how this string trigger mechanism works. We've got a standard trigger mechanism here. This has got to be pulled back, so obviously with the cords in front, we've got to go through an eyelet with a piece of cord to the trigger. And then this is going through a loop there, which then goes to the remote firing position. Three, two, one. That seemed to work really effectively. It took quite a good pull on the cord, but all four crossbows fired, so we got 16 bolts. If these had been a bit more powerful catapults, that would have been a fairly formidable barrage of arrows. So having seen this work, it seems entirely appropriate to try and adapt this technology, the same triggering system, and see if we can make it work on the crossbow cart. This simple trigger mechanism seems plausible, considering the extreme urgency confronting Schwan and his men. When Yang Xuan found himself in this predicament, where he was outnumbered by a factor of many, many times, he'd really got to come up with a very, very quick strategy to equalize the odds. And it's likely that his engineers might have come up with this idea on the spur of the moment using very, very basic technology. But how would this technology enable the crossbows to be triggered by the wheels, as the ancient account says? As the wheel rotates, that drives the axle, and wound around it is this cord. So as the carriage proceeds, this cord is being gradually wound up. And when it reaches a point at which it's tight, it then pulls this lever here and slips off. And that lever is attached to the firing cord of one of the catapults. Through his research into ancient Chinese technology, Richard has established how the unmanned crossbow chariot might have worked. But how would it have performed in practice against the rebel army that threatened the district of Ling Ling? For the first time in nearly 2,000 years, the world's first unmanned battlefield weapon is put to the test. Well, we seem to have reasonable success with that. It's proving that the system does actually work. I think if you're in the front ranks of an enemy formation and you've got huge carts hurtling towards you with mad horses, um, obviously with their tails on, on fire, they're going to be pretty manic. That could be scary enough in itself, but then when suddenly you're faced with these barrages of arrows, you don't know exactly where they're coming from. Absolute panic, mayhem, your immediate reaction is to fire back at them. And accounts do actually mention that the enemy formations ended up firing at themselves. Our investigators have discovered that with the technology available to him, Yang Xuan and his engineers could have made this unmanned crossbow cart. They created a method of warfare that would inspire the military engineers of the 21st century. The idea of a remotely operating vehicle is almost bringing us back to modern day technology where they're trying to keep live soldiers out of the actual combat zone and they're sending remotely controlled machines into battle instead. So in a sense, it's kind of come in full circle after 2,000 years. The ancient Chinese engineers were capable of creating twisted weapons that were hundreds of years ahead of their time. Long forgotten Chinese military innovations have been resurrected on today's battlefield, not only in systems of attack, but also of defense.
Next, we investigate the most unlikely of defense systems, armor made of nothing more than paper. Today's armed forces rely on body armor to protect themselves on the battlefield. The inventive and twisted weapons of the ancient East required defense systems that were every bit as ingenious. The military of the ancient world wore armor that was far ahead of its time. Our investigations have brought us to the Royal Armories in the UK, one of the foremost centers of arms and armory studies in the world. For much of antiquity, men were encased in male armor. Male armor, though you don't tend to see so much of it in museum collections today, was in fact a very, very successful form of armor. Worn by virtually every civilization of the ancient world, from 1000 BC up to the Middle Ages, mail was the armor of choice for millennia. But there was a weapon that could penetrate this defense, the crossbow. The crossbow could release as much, if not more, power than a normal bow and required a fraction of the skill to learn it. The reason the Chinese were using crossbows is you can train a man to operate it in about 15 minutes. You don't need to be a skilled soldier to use it. The introduction of the crossbow meant more powerful arrows and larger numbers of people using them on the battlefield. The arrow had been on the battlefield for millennia. The crossbow rapidly increased its penetration power, and this posed a particular threat to the wearers of mail. What mail isn't so good at is dealing with missiles. Um, sharp pointed arrowheads uh, will find their way through gaps and force open the links. Armorers had to find something new. Enter the Rolls Royce of ancient armor systems, plate armor. Where crossbows and probably longbow arrows could rip through mail, they couldn't penetrate plate armor. But there was one important problem. The cons of plate armor is that it's very expensive. And certainly the vast majority of the people on a battlefield couldn't think about buying a plate armor. People had to find affordable alternatives to protect themselves, and often they turned to quilted armor. Even on the medieval battlefields of 15th century Europe, where we would imagine knights uh, romping around encased in solid steel, in fact, the vast majority of the people on any given battlefield had almost no defenses at all, or at best, uh, a simple quilted fabric jack. But this armor was nothing more than fabric and gave little protection against the more heavy-duty weapons of war. It's effective as long as you don't hit it too hard with anything too sharp. The people of the ancient world needed an armor that was affordable while still protecting them from crossbow bolts. Our investigations have brought us to China, to a written account from the 8th century which reveals the use of an astonishing material. According to the source, the ancient Chinese used nothing more than paper to armor their troops. How was this possible? Paper armor is another of these seemingly unlikely Chinese inventions, which were actually quite practical. The first we hear about paper armor is in the Tang Dynasty in about the 8th century AD, when at least a thousand soldiers are said to have been equipped with this type of protection, which was proof even against powerful arrows. Could paper armor really have stopped heavy arrows as the ancient Chinese account states? There is only one way to find out. We must make and test it. Ancient armor specialist Jamie Hood is searching the few manuals that mention paper armor for clues about how to recreate it. There is actually very little information specifically regarding um, paper armor, and it's very much a lost art. Investigations have uncovered a Chinese manual from 1621, which seems to contain a drawing of paper armor. The one illustration that we have of paper armor from the Ming Encyclopedia, the Wubei Zhe, shows a coat with what looked like little scales, and it says paper armor. Scale armor was used extensively in ancient China, but in its traditional leather and metal form, scale armor couldn't stop crossbows. So what was it about the paper version that could? What paper armor does is utilize clever design 
to maximize the protective qualities of this type of armor. Through a process of folding the paper into many layers and coating it with resin, it is turned from a simple piece of paper into a solid armor scale. With the finishing touches completed, we can, for the first time, test if the ancient sources were accurate. Can paper really stop a powerful arrow? Ancient weapons specialist John Naylor has taken the armor to our testing center, where he will fire an arrow from his replica Chinese crossbow. Here we have a reproduction crossbow suitable for the period. Great if you're trying to raise an army of levies. Militia soldiers brought in off the land, put into cheap armor with cheap weapons to fight your battles. For the first time in 900 years, we are discovering whether Chinese paper armor can withstand the force of heavy arrows. The arrow John is going to fire will be traveling at approximately 45 miles per hour. It's not as hard as I expected, but a perfect example of why this arm is done in scales. We've penetrated through the top scale, come out about half an inch behind, but it's been stopped by the scale underneath. This guy looks as though he's in trouble, but he's perfectly safe. And this ties into the stories of why they describe men looking like porcupines with arrows sticking in them. Brilliant. Our investigations have confirmed that paper armor is able to stop arrows from a crossbow. The ancient Chinese created a lightweight armor capable of stopping the bullets of its day. This kind of body armor would not be seen on the battlefield again until the 20th century. For whatever reason, none of these technologies caught on, and it's not until the 20th century and the development of spun polyaramids like Kevlar, ballistic nylons, and ceramic trauma panels that bulletproof armor has arrived. And now, of course, more armor is being worn on the battlefield than at any time since the 17th century. Next, Ancient Discoveries journeys to the deserts of the ancient East, to terrain which changed the way wars were fought and introduced a new weapon onto the battlefield. In the ancient East, weapons, rider, and animal together form the ultimate weapons system. In the desert terrain that often faced the commanders of the East, the choice of animal was between the horse and the camel. We are investigating these two living weapons systems. Our investigations have brought us to the British Museum in London to examine Assyrian reliefs carved over 2,700 years ago. In one section, Arab camel riders are depicted fleeing from their Assyrian enemies, armed with bows and arrows. I think this particular relief is probably the earliest definitive evidence we have for camels being used in battle, as opposed to in warfare as a means of transport. Why did ancient commanders even consider this unlikely beast as a weapon over the horse? The various people who swept across what you could call the camel lands, that is, the Arabian Peninsula and its immediate neighbors, adopted the camel very, very quickly for the obvious reasons that the camel could do things in certain areas which the horse can't. Camels can last for up to a week without water where a horse cannot last more than half a day. And they have a piece of natural engineering which gives them a very clear advantage over the horse in desert warfare. Dust and sand thrown up during a battle, or worse, during a desert sandstorm, can blind a horse, but the camel can continue to fight. A camel's eye has eyelids much like a human's, but during a sandstorm, I have to shut my eyes or protect them somehow. The camel has another trick up its sleeve. It has an extra semi-transparent eyelid here. Now, during a sandstorm, if sand should build up on this third eyelid, then, like an enormous windshield wiper, the eyelid can move across and clear the sand. 
Impressive though this may be, a camel needs more than this to be useful in battle. Carl Ude Martinez is an expert horseman and ancient battle reenactor. He has traveled to the deserts of Egypt to help us discover whether the horse or the camel is a better war mount on desert terrain. Joining him in our quest is Bedouin camel rider El Batal, whose name in English means the champ. Riding an animal that has the ability to reach fast speeds quickly was integral to a commander's success on the battlefield. A camel's foot is far better suited to traveling on sand. Perhaps this will give it an advantage over a horse when it comes to reaching faster speeds in the desert. When ancient armies lined up before battle, they made sure they were out of range of enemy arrows. But when the order to advance was given, they wanted to cross this killing zone as quickly as possible. So the speed of the horse or camel is only relevant over the distance an arrow can shoot. So to set the distance of the speed test, Carl is going to use his bow and arrow. Right, what we're going to do now is we're going to fire a bow and arrow, and that's going to mark the distance between two battle lines. And this is also going to mark the distance between which the horse and the camel are going to race. The winner will be whoever covers the distance the arrow flies first. 300 yards? Yeah, it's pretty good. Let's go for it. Oh, yeah, I won. This thing's like a little core spring. When I first saw the camel, I thought, oh, size, he's got long legs, he's going to beat me on the flat. I mean, I'm not used to our horses, and this thing just flew. What a fantastic machine, stunning, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs> but I kicked his ass. <laughs> when charging into battle, there's no question which animal the ancient commander would have preferred. But ancient sources clearly tell us the camel was used in battle. The ancient writer Herodian tells us that in the Battle of Nisibis in 217 AD, the Parthians used both camels and horses as battle mounts. We have this, this story of camels being used as cavalry mounts at the Battle of Nisibis. When riding an animal into battle and fighting from it, you needed to know that you could maneuver. Perhaps the camel's maneuverability was superior to that of the horse. The lads have just setting up some targets with some paper on, and we've basically got to go down and try and stab it as hard as we can, as if we were in battle from one side to the next. Stop, turn, gallop off, stop, turn. Basically trying to reenact what would happen in a battle scenario. It's going to be very, very interesting to see what happens with this test. I'm not actually sure which way it's going to go, so um, let's see what happens. The course being built has been carefully designed to test the limits of the animal's maneuverability. The eight poles have been set nine yards apart with four targets placed in the center of the course, two on either side of the poles. Well, the lads have finished setting up the course. Uh, looks quite interesting, actually. Ahmed's going to time us. We're going to do time trials. We're not going down together. The camel's going to go first, then I'm going to go second on the horse, and literally it will be the quickest through down to the finish and hit all the targets on the way through. The camel has completed the course in just 31 seconds. How will the horse match up? The horse's time is just 26 seconds. It was close, but once again, the horse has beaten the camel. Well, interesting result. I said I didn't know which way it was going to go, and uh, I actually thought that the champ would win, but I did get him on the time. Our investigations have discovered that when it comes to riding into battle, the horse would clearly be a superior choice. Its speed and maneuverability are measurably greater than that of the camel, even on the camel's natural terrain, the desert. 
I think going into battle every time I would choose uh, this stunning creature. I mean, it's um, it is small. Uh, obviously, it can't you know take as much stuff as as the camel can, but. You've got the speed, you've got the agility, you've got the manoeuvrability, and uh, literally it is push button. I just wanted to go, I've got to get away from the enemy, or I've got to charge towards the enemy, and it just flew. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. The camel seemed to have no place on the ancient battlefield. This is a mystery. Why do the sources clearly tell us that they were used? The answer lies in one very obvious feature, its size. One look at the camel, and the commanders of the east saw its potential. It towers over a horse. This massive difference in size means the camel can be used in all sorts of ways the horse can't. At Nisibis, there is another dimension to the way in which the camels were used. Herodian's account uses the word cataphract, and this generally means the steed, as well as the rider, is armored. Herodia gives an actually very sensible and believable account of the Battle of Nisibis in 217, in which uh, a Roman army is assaulted by Parthians who have light horse archers uh, on their flanks and a corps of cataphract cavalry and camelry. It's quite clear that the uh, camels themselves are armored as well as their riders. What can an armored camel do that a horse can't? An armored camel has a few advantages. It's bigger and taller than a horse, so the people are likely to be more overawed on foot by a camel coming towards them, encased in metal armor. Like an ancient tank, the camel would have been encased in armor and sent charging into enemy lines, causing utter disruption and chaos. But comparisons to the tank do not stop there. The camel could also be turned into a mobile gun unit. This is a camel gun. Um, essentially, it's a light cannon designed to go on the back of a camel, and it was used as mobile artillery in the battlefield. It's a very successful design because essentially you can transport artillery, albeit of small caliber, um, over very difficult terrain quite cheaply. So it was a very effective means of bringing firepower to bear um, in portions of the world uh, where such artillery wasn't expected. And it was an extremely effective tool once it had arrived on the battlefield. The Persian name for it is Zambarek, which means little wasp which gives a very good indication of its battlefield role. Essentially, it was designed to harass and annoy the enemy, um, firing at them uh, at a range where they couldn't actually respond. Ultimately, the camel's sheer size, coupled with the addition of guns and armor, made it into a twisted weapon in its own right. It became an integral part of the armies of the East and would remain so until modern times. But the twisted ways the commanders of the ancient East used to attack their enemies meant the invention of weapons that defy the imagination. Our next investigation introduces us to ancient Indian martial artists and their terrifying arsenal of weapons. The vibrant fabric of Indian life contains a hidden thread of terrifying and brutal weapons a throwing device that could sever a man's limb, a sword that history tells us killed nine men with only one blow, and a booby trap that could have inspired a Hollywood movie. These are the twisted weapons of ancient India. Our investigations have discovered a 16th century Indian text called the Akbar Nama. These things are very often wonderfully illustrated with um, superb miniatures in extreme detail which show armor and weaponry and all the slightly, particularly in Mughal India, slightly bizarre weaponry that they tended to go in for. An illustration of a battle described in the Akbar Nama clearly shows what looks like circular metal objects being used as weapons. What are these frisbee-like devices the warriors are using? Investigations point towards a weapon known as the chakar, an ancient Indian projectile. Chakar! 
Nidar Singh is a member of the Sikh warrior tribe known as the Akali Nihal. They were the front line of the Sikh army, created in the early 17th century. Uh, Akali Nihang is a traditional vanguard of the Sikh nation. They're the defenders of the Sikh faith. They were employed as personal bodyguards by the Sikh gurus and employed as uh, guards of Sikh temples. And it's their special weapon, the chakka. The chakar varied in size from 5 to 12 inches in diameter and was up to an inch in width. The Akali Nihang would send a barrage of these ancient steel projectiles into enemy ranks to break up the front lines of their formations. Deployed in every battle, the Sikhs fought for over 300 years. It was the signature weapon of these ancient commandos. So what we have is a, almost a flat ring. So the bottom will be slightly flat. Slightly asymmetric curve here, gives it a bit of airfoil. And what you have with outer edge is sharp as possible. So the idea is when it's thrown, at any single point where it touches, it will cut. So rather than, than a conventional throwing knife that can only do damage with one single point, the idea of a chakra is that it doesn't matter where it hits, it will do damage with. And being, as it spins, it digs through, cuts through. So it may hit here, but spinning, it widens the wound, digs in further. An account from a traveler to ancient India, Duarte Barbosa, reveals the startling ways in which the chakar was used. And they carry seven or eight of these each, put on the left arm, and they take one and put it on the finger of the right hand and make it spin round many times, and so they hurl it at their enemies. And if they hit anyone on the arm or leg or neck, it cuts through all. Would it be possible for the chakar to actually sever a limb as Barbosa wrote, in ancient times, the Sikhs would use sugarcane to test their weapons. Traditionally, they consider sugarcane to be the same consistency of bones. So even in Sikh rituals, where they do sacrifices and so on to the goddess Jindi, they employ sugar canes to represent uh, limbs. To authentically test the chakar, we will use sugarcane just as the ancient Sikhs did. Will we discover that the chakar is able to cut through a limb? Through our investigations, we have discovered that Barbosa's account was true. The ancient Indian engineers created a weapon capable of slicing through a man's limb. But delving deeper into ancient texts, we find a shocking story which seems too impossible to be true. How did a single warrior kill nine people in only one attack using an ancient steel whip. In searching for answers, researchers have rediscovered a martial art that has been lost to the world for centuries, Kalare Payatu. Our investigation has brought us to the birthplace of this ancient fighting technique, Kerala in southern India. Guru Dinishan has been practicing Kalari Payatu for over 30 years. He is one of the foremost experts in the world. The 3,000-year-old Kalari Payatu is considered to be the mother of all forms of martial arts across the world. This ancient martial art has an arsenal of weapons, but there is one that is unique. It is called the Urumi a weapon made of flexible steel that is less than a tenth of an inch thick, so it behaves more like a whip than a sword. The Arumi is made from the same kind of metal used to make clock springs. Usually this metal would be softened to suit the Arumi. It was widely used in ancient India not only by people settling personal differences, but also in official disputes where a warrior from either side would be chosen to battle it out in one-to-one -one combat. Generally, a sword can only kill a single person at once, whereas the Arumi can be used to attack a number of people at the same time. This was when the weapon was most useful, when a single warrior was forced to take on several opponents. A story from medieval India illustrates this perfectly. In 16th century Kerala, the Indian warrior Thacholi Othanan and the eldest brother of nine from a local family squared up to settle a dispute. Armed with their Urumis, they engaged in battle. 
Othanan soon realized he faced a superior foe. In ancient times, Kalari Payatu was used to resolve a difference of opinion. The fight lasts until either warrior dies. Othanan had no choice but to retreat if he was to escape with his life. But his pride was wounded. He had to avenge his honor. Attacking later under the cover of darkness, the ancient account tells us he killed all nine of the brothers with his Urumi. Could this be possible? Could the Urumi enable one man to kill nine single-handedly? Gurukai Dinishan has enlisted the help of one of his students to investigate the truth of this ancient Indian story. Could Thacholi Othanan have sliced through all nine brothers in just one attack? Nine targets have been set up to represent the nine brothers that Othanan attacked. Gurukal's student will attack them only once, just as Othanan did. In order to avoid hurting himself with the Urumi, Gurukal's student must constantly twist the Urumi around his body in an almost vertical plane. Using this method, as Othanan would have too, we will be able to discover whether this ancient Indian story is plausible. In only one attack with his Urumi, Gurukal's student has destroyed all nine targets. If these had been people, they would have stood little chance against this terrifying weapon. The test has shown that it is possible that Thacholi Othanan could have killed nine people at once using this method. Through our investigations, we have discovered that this ancient Indian story is credible. The vicious effectiveness of the Urumi is such that one man could kill nine single-handedly. But the ancient commanders of India had even more terrifying tools in their arsenal. At the dawn of Indian civilization as we know it, weapons were being designed and deployed that were the ultimate expression of a twisted mind. As we journey deep into India's past, we have uncovered perhaps the most twisted weapon of all. In the early third century BC, a young commander called Chandragupta rid India of foreign invaders. He became India's first emperor at the tender age of 20, establishing the largest kingdom ever to rule over the region, the Mauryan Empire. The Mauryan Empire included a vast geographical area. It consisted of most of the states of current India and some of Pakistan as well. But once he had freed India, he installed his own reign of terror that was far worse than that of the foreign invaders. Chandragupta's rule was guided by a military and political treatise called the Arthasastra. It is a Machiavellian masterpiece containing countless methods of murdering your enemy. Ancient Discoveries has tracked down one of the few remaining copies, hidden in a manuscripts library in southern India. No television crew outside of India has ever been allowed access to this treasure trove of forgotten texts. It holds one of the oldest copies of the Arthasastra in the world transcribed from the original over 600 years ago. Within the pages of this ancient text, there is one paragraph in particular that highlights its brutality. Or he should make him drop down by the release of a pin into a well with spikes or a pit underneath the bed or seat where the floor is fixed by a mechanism. Bed booby trap, the bed booby trap has been described in the Arthasastra. The trap was made by making a hole under the bed or sofa of an enemy. The hole is filled with spikes operated by a mechanical device. The enemy was made to fall suddenly and was killed. This trap was adopted to kill powerful enemies with ease.
One problem with investigating this booby trap is that it was a stealth weapon. But booby trap were all the details of the bed booby trap were always kept a secret. Because of this secrecy, there are no accounts that tell us when Chandragupta actually used this device. With the sparse information available to him, Richard Windley is investigating this ancient instrument of terror. He has come to our testing center in order to build a full-size model of it. But first, he must build a smaller prototype to help him understand how the trapdoor mechanism functions. This is my little model of the Chandragupta booby trap bed. It's a very, very simple little model. The account that we've got is fleeting. It's, there's only a mention of this device, so we're working by supposition, really. We've got basically a kind of trapdoor, which is probably something similar to a stage trapdoor mechanism, a long cord which would trigger it. The top represents the floor of the room. This would probably have been furnished quite opulently, and there may have been rugs and, and uh, textiles covering the floor, which would help to hide the trapdoor. But it could also be arranged, like I've done it here, so that the gaps align with the floorboard so it wouldn't be too obvious. So the bed is attached to the trapdoor, it's hinged, and underneath there is a little catch mechanism. The operators of the device then give a really sharp tug on this rope. This releases the catches. The bed drops, the body falls straight onto the spikes below, and they would hit these spikes with great force. This could penetrate the body, it could penetrate the skull, it could penetrate all sorts of internal organs. So the chances are this guy is going to be dead almost instantaneously. But how would this device have been employed? I think it's pretty unlikely that this would have been set up in an enemy's house because you'd need really full access to the property. It would probably take a team of workmen several days, at the very least, to set up something like this. It'd be very, very difficult to do this surreptitiously. So I think it's more likely that this would actually have been installed in one of Chandragupta's own palaces. An enemy who had been invited as a guest would settle down to sleep, never to wake up again. Politically, this might be a kind of expedient way of, of um, removing people. Once the trapdoor's back in place, the catches are reset, only someone inside the room would actually know what had happened. So anyone coming in, perhaps in the morning, would just find everything exactly as it was the previous night. But the victim has just simply disappeared. Now that he has understood how the booby trap works, Richard has been able to build a full-size replica and is going to test it out for the first time in over 2,000 years. We've had a full-size replica of the model built. The bed is a normal full-size bed, about six feet long, uh, roughly three feet wide. We've got the trapdoor installed, and we've got a drop of about 10 feet and some very, very nasty spikes. So what we really need to do now is to actually test this device and just to see how lethal it actually is. Seeing this weapon as its inventor intended, we can begin to appreciate the gruesome fate that would have awaited anyone who fell victim to it. Richard is placing melons on the bed in order to demonstrate its destructive power. Well, really, you've only got to take a look at this horrendous mess here to, to imagine what this would do to a human body. It seems a pretty remote chance that you could possibly survive this. It could easily impale the skull, the major organs, it could sever major arteries. You can imagine the limbs being impaled on it. It is absolutely horrible. It doesn't really bear thinking about. The horrific death this weapon inflicted would have been immediately hidden to the world as the trap door was pulled shut again. The carnage below the surface would be concealed and the body removed, ready for the next unfortunate enemy of this ancient Indian emperor. Even in a time that seems to us harsh and barbaric, a device like this seems excessive. This seems to be like the product really of a twisted mind. From the deserts of Arabia to the battlefields of ancient China, our investigations into the ancient East reveal a history of twisted and macabre weapons.
As explorations into these forgotten corners of the world continue, what other twisted tools of terror lie waiting to be discovered?